Namaste, everyone. Today, we're going over Strangers from a Different Shore by Ronald Takaki, Chapter 4, The World of Plantation Hawaii. Hawaii is made up of multiple islands with uh, t probably two or three of them uh, mostly populated. But again, I want you to know that there are multiple islands that make up Hawaii and it's within the Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands. So there's actually other islands that are surrounding as well. So not just Hawaii, but other islands. Now, so the reason why we talked about it uh, very explosively, we talked about how uh, Asian immigration, Im Asian labor came about because of African Americans' end of slavery. So again, we talked about how African Americans are so intricately intertwined with Asian Americans. One, we are only able to come to this country because of the fact that actually slavery ended. So we had to fill a slavery hole. A labor pool. But also, African Americans were the ones who advocated for the wonderful 1965 Immigration Act, also known as the Heart Seller Act, which enabled the majority or large portions of Latinos and African Americans. Question, do you think the majority of Latinos, African Americans know, I'm sorry, Latinos, Asian Americans know that the reason why they're in this country legally is because of African American labor shortage as well as African American avocation and 1960s uh, to, to push for the 1965 Immigration Act? Hmm. You answer that by yourself. Now, the world of Plantation Hawaii was an intense, un unjust system that was labor intensive. So you see here Asians living in these uh, uncomfortable barracks, uh, pushed away from their home and actually, uh, actually paid to actually farm in Hawaii and mostly it was sugarcane. So here you have some Asian women who are, uh, who are farmers. Asian women got paid less than Asian men. So let's look at the timeline. 1850, it's a master's and servant act, a legalized apprenticeship, indentured service and the contract labor system. Now, 1851, you start seeing Chinese imported, and we talked about the labor shortage because slavery was over. So what they did is they looked to the East, particularly to Asia, and they imported Asian workers. Now, eight, not just Asian workers, Portuguese were also, uh, Spaniards and Russians and Norwegians in 1952 were also imported along with Filipinos, Koreans, and Japanese. So in 1990, Hawaii becomes a state. Now here is a sugar, uh, Filipino sugar worker. It was intensely a large amount of work uh, in the sun. Of course, no air conditioning, uh, very, very difficult times. And uh, lots of Filipino workers were imported to Hawaii. Now sugar is king. So I'd like to ask you, how does sugar affect ethnic diversification? So we had the native Hawaiians that you could not force to actually farm their land, right? So sometimes their land was taken away from them forcefully. So you're not gonna ask the people that you would take the land forcefully from them to farm their own land, right? Again, kind of like a slave. So how does it diversify? So you're right, because the, the, you didn't have so much of a native population labor, you brought in the Chinese, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Filipinos, the Russians, the Portuguese, uh, the Spaniards to, to fill this labor pool. Now, I wanna ask you something very startling. In 1853, Hawaiians represented 97% of the population. 70 years later, over 70 years later from 1953, now Hawaiians only represent 16%. I want to say it's even less now. Now, why is that? Well, there's many answers, such as um, they actually, some of them died, some of them didn't reproduce as much, and also just the large influx of East Asians, Southeast Asians, as well as Europeans. Now, this is a very dramatic decrease in their population and very controversial. To this day, Native Hawaiians actually are not doing as well as um, the, the immigrants, such as those new immigrant arrivals. And that is something that um, is very, very touchy and political. Now, these laborers had very intense hard work. They were treated no better than cows or horses, okay? I kid you not. 
every worker was called by number and not by name. So question, who was also called by number and not by name? I'm thinking War II. I'm thinking Holocaust. Who do you think? You're right. It was Jewish people. They're also called by numbers. So actually, one could argue that this was a way to dehumanize the multiple Asian workers, as well as the Portuguese workers. Now, 7% of the workers were women. Women were paid at, at that time 55 cents a day. Men were paid, you see, for the same work, 78 cents a day. Now, the Chinese and Japanese workers, they worked side by side sometimes, and they were intensely hard workers. They came from a foreign background sometimes from where they came, and they really transformed Hawaii into growable land that you see today. But I don't want you to think of these, all these different Asian groups as just being oppressed, called by name, treated no, uh, dissimilar from cows or horses. They resisted, so I want you to know that. They fought back. 1920s, in the Oahu uh, sugar strike of 1920, the Japanese and Filipino workers went on strike together for six months at four major Hawaiian islands. This is huge. This talks about uh, intercultural, interethnic uh, coalition um, and that they are fighting against their injustice, not just by themselves. So they, they were smart. They got together. Now, the workers, they fought against their oppression, their overseers. And again, it was massive uh, resistance. They rioted. There was murders committed. There was protests. And as Michel Foucault says, where there is power, there's resistance. So there's collective uh, labor actions. And actually, that really improved, in some aspects, not fully, the labor conditions that they were subjected to. But unfortunately, after the, the Chinese and Filipino went on strike, guess what? They brought in other different Asian workers to fill that spot. So also, there are other ways that they feigned resistance. Um, feigned, I mean, as in faking resistance. Similar to resistance to African-American slaves. Like, a lot of people, the narrative is slaves never fought back. Actually, that's not true. So African-American slaves fought back all the time. They called in, they try to act like they're sick. They try to um, work not, when no one's looking at them. They try to rest. They try to do lots of different ways of resistance, okay? So again, uh, these workers totally resisted. We talked about riots, protests, feigning sickness, or running away from their contract. But also, you know, just to, um, just to go through, get through the day, they also... Um, you know, took drugs, they drank wine, they fleed their contracts before they're over. They actually, after their contract, they never came back, okay? So question, why did these workers resist? And what reflected the social hierarchy of the camp? So have you guys heard of the, the ladder theory? of immigration. It's like, I got through, but after me, let's pull up the ladder. Okay, no one after me. So unfortunately, what happened was the original workers, they were all mistreated, and then they striked, and then they got a little bit higher increase, but then they brought in new people, and the new people were, were paid less than the old people. And again, this is as old as time all over the labor systems, is that's the social hierarchy. Who came first, they got most of it, and who came last gets the least. So again, I want to talk about in 1907, uh, 1909, about the many strikes that happened. The Japanese organized the Waipu plantation strikes because of the differential treatment based on their ethnic group. For example, Portuguese, they, they were actually paid $22.50, and the Japanese were paid $18 for the same type of work? That's totally unfair. And the sugar plantation imported Koreans, Hawaiians, and, Jap and Filipinos to break the strikes. And guess what? I'm going to say they darn sure made less than $18. So again, very unequal for the same, uh, unequal payment for the same exact work. So here you're looking at this picture of 1946, Great Hawaiian Sugarcane Strike. Again, you see it's multi-ethnic as well as gendered. So eventually they do get better conditions. Today, many of these Asian descendants are doing better versus the native Hawaiians who have decreased academic outcomes and are overrepresented in the prison industrial system. So I want you to think about that. There is actually some aspect how the new Asian immigrants, including um, Portuguese, uh, are doing much better now socioeconomically than the actual native or indigenous Hawaiians. 
So I want you to discuss this at home. I want you to think about it. And I want to teach you this concept called settler colonialism. Now, it's a form of colonialism that seeks to replace the original population of the colonized territory with a new society of settlers. Of course, great example of this would be the British when they came to the United States. And they, you know, of course, they settled, colonized the United States with their British descendants and the other European descendants. They slowly but surely replaced, but not fully, because um, Native Americans always fought back at every step, uh, the, 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 the people that were already living in the United States. Now, did these early Asian immigrants to Hawaii enact settler colonialism? Now, there's lots and lots of books on this. I want you to look it up. It's a very deep and very political discussion that I want you to have with yourself. All right, have a wonderful day.